12 for Tuesday, but a bit of a twist. I got a really bad sore throat. And I don't feel like spitting the bingo thing. So you're going to get more Tolva than you ever wanted. Andrew, floor is yours. Um, well, hello, everybody. Happy Tolva Tuesday. We had um, quite the week of upsets this last week. Um, the Bills losing to the Jaguars 9-6. to six. We saw the Broncos uh, go into Dallas and just destroy them 30-16. to 16. And even then, the score does not do justice to what the Broncos did and um, there were a couple like the uh, the Saints taking down or getting taken down by the Falcons and the Titans going into LA and taking it down the Rams so um, I think we should all go around here and uh, talk about some of these upsets um, talk about what happened and uh, if, if this if this whole upset thing is here to stay or uh, or if it was an off week. So our, our Bills analysts here, Yestin Harris and Bryce Martino, um, I'll let you all go back and forth. But I, uh, along with everyone else listening, I would like to know what happened in Jacksonville on Sunday. The floor is yours. It was essentially a masterclass in pass rushing for, by the 29th ranked unit in the entire league. Um, somehow, one of the most mediocre offensive lines, because Buffalo doesn't have a terrible offensive line, but it's not yeah, good the middle right of pack. Yeah, and um, something went wrong today. Um, sorry, not on today, on Sunday. And um, every single snap, they were just getting swarmed. And when you can get pressure like that with four rushes, then you're going to dominate damn near any offense in the league. I mean, a prime example is what happened to Kansas City against Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl. It's mm-hmm. just sort of highlighted league-wide the need for quality offensive line play. And right now, especially on the interior, like the guard positions, the Bills are missing that. Um, combined, you know, regardless of that, Buffalo still should have been able to do enough to win this game. Um, I mean, but, Jacksonville put up nine points and we still couldn't beat them somehow. Yeah. We had one red zone. We got in the red zone one time and it was on the first drive of the game. Mm-hmm. Mm. It, it was pitiful. Um, and it's not so much the uh, the lack of scoring. It was the sort of the lack of effort in the end that killed us. I mean, you know, by the time, you know, we're getting into those late game scenarios, you need the drive, you need the comeback. And, you know, you finally get a decent pocket. You finally get a receiver open, you know, and you finally hit them in the numbers and it, it just doesn't <laughs> catch it. Um, it's, the, the they took the life out of Buffalo early and um, they just couldn't get back on their feet. And it's not something you were used to seeing from the Bills. Um, yeah. You know, Going, coming through a franchise that's taken a lot of heat over the past two decades. Um, you know, even these, these new young guys used to have that chip on their shoulder and now they might just be missing. Um, they didn't have that, oh, we're going to prove them wrong. We're going to, you know, beat the doubters. They expected to win this game. They played like they expected to win this game anyway. And it came back to bite them. Yeah. I mean, so who in specific? Go ahead, Bryce. No, I was just saying. Non Josh Allen attempts, we only ran the ball nine times for 22 yards. Both running yeah. backs had two yards, an average of two yards per carry. I saw a stat yesterday: Bills running backs average point or 0.2 yards before contact per rush. Mm. Cody Ford and Ike Bucker were just—they're just letting anyone, everyone, and anyone buy the whole entire game. I think this offensive line is missing Spencer Brown more than I think anyone expected it to. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think Spencer Brown would even start this season. Um, and yet, somehow, he's quickly become one of our most capable offensive linemen. And with him missing, um, you know, we've got a guard playing tackle. and uh... Our offensive line plays much better with Spencer Brown in because that allows us to move. Um, Daryl Williams inside, and that's where he flourishes. That's where the entire that's offensive best. line flourishes. Right. Yeah, and we've seen so much I mean, of that success. Who in healthy. specific was um, was was in the backfield the most for Jacksonville? I mean, obviously we know Josh Allen and that whole storyline that was harped upon this whole week. Um, and, and he's a good player. Obviously, he's he's going to get um, good reps every game. 
But outside of Josh Allen versus Josh Allen, was there anyone that was standing out for Jacksonville? Taven Bryan. Somehow, some way, we made Taven Bryan look like an all star finally after what three years in the league. Yeah. I'm trying to pull yeah. up the stats right now. He yeah, had two sacks, two, sacks, two sacks. tackles for loss. Yep. Um, two tackles for loss, two quarterback hits, um, and he had about five pressures on that game. Um, so, so is, is the problem in Buffalo the interior of the offensive line? Oh, definitely. That's like the only thing wrong with offensive line right now because I think we have our tackles set with Dawkins and Brown. Mm. Yeah, but and, we and pretty Morse much is an above nothing. average center, so I'm yeah. happy with him. Uh, but even then, was, when, when Spencer Brown's playing, Daryl Daryl uh, Williams is inside. So, and uh, Mitch Morse, when he's healthy, he's a he's a good center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was so, the only one that didn't allow five, five plus pressures in one sack. Yeah. yeah, last week, everyone else just Mitch was Morse. letting any, everyone back. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, it was definitely surprising. Obviously, the score reflects a good defensive showing from both teams. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's much easier to do that on Jacksonville than to, to do that all. So instead of keeping y'all suffering, um, we know what happened there. Obviously, it was an off day from Josh Allen. Um, but that answers my question. Lots of pressure on the quarterback. That's how you rattle teams. I remember... Last year, in almost all of Tampa Bay's losses, it, it was because they couldn't they couldn't block for Tom. Mm. So, um, if you have the, a bad offensive line, it it doesn't matter who you played. Even the worst the offensive lines can still get to you. Right. Yeah. Um, which then brings us to the next upset, which was the Broncos versus the Cowboys, and that was a game where the Broncos actually protected Teddy Bridgewater. Um, very well for the first and time al- ever allowed him to hit his talented receivers against a let's face it <clears throat> this is not a great Cowboys secondary Trayvon Diggs is giving up a lot of yards big plays in specific we saw the big one to Tim Patrick um, who is when everyone's healthy their fourth their fourth best receiver on the field behind KJ Hamler Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton um, did you guys get a chance to look at that game at all I got to review I it in passing. It, yeah. um, unfortunately, I had uh, yeah, but it was already down near over by the time I would have had a chance to check in. So yeah. I, I rewatched it later, but only in, in condense. Javante Williams looked really good that game too, like better than Melvin Gordon by far. Um, I was lucky enough today to talk to um, Broncos starting left guard Dalton Reisner who was a second round pick out of Kansas state. He's been starting ever since his rookie year. And um, the first thing he said when he walked into the gym and got the mic was how about our win over the Cowboys? It's a big momentum shifter and culture um, definer in that Broncos locker room. And luckily I was able to talk to him about it afterwards. And they said, or he said that he was, uh, he has never been more proud of that offensive line throughout three seasons of being with the Broncos. And um, we know that Vic Tangio's had multiple seasons there, but this, this win felt different. This almost felt like um, this, was, this was a defining win for that Broncos locker room. Um, they played great on both sides of the ball, but their offense was just what, what really surprised me. They were, they were firing on all cylinders. All their big names were, were showing up. Um, and what, what's funny is, is they didn't even – they didn't need uh, Noah Fant at all. They didn't even target him. Um, but Tim Patrick, Jerry Judy, uh, Kendall Hinton got the ball. The the uh, former Wake Forest quarterback turned wide receiver who played a game for them last year. Albert O had a couple catches. Melvin Gordon was involved in the passing game. And Cortland Sutton only had one catch. So they were really dealing the ball there, spreading it out. And uh, they, they really embarrassed the, the, the Cowboys in Dallas. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was definitely a, a surprising win for the Broncos. But um, after watching their film, it was clean. I mean, it's not like the, 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 the Cowboys floundered or anything. Like, this was just a dominant performance from the Denver Broncos. So, um, 
we had a lot of division shifting this week too. Um, now at the bottom of the AFC North is the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, the Miami Dolphins are in last place in the AFC East. The Denver Broncos, despite the big win, are still last place in the AFC East, West. Um, and uh, one of the bigger games that, that we saw this week was uh, came on Monday night. And I think it was very telling for the future of one quarterback named Justin Fields. The Steelers played the Bears, and uh, it, it, was, it was exciting towards the end. A classic Bears flounder at the end. But we saw a lot from Justin Fields, so our football boys on here, what do you guys think of Justin Fields' performance on Monday night? I think he was pretty spectacular for considering he's a rookie. Um, I mean, you know, he obviously, you know, when you come into this league as a, you know, a rookie and you end up starting during your first season, you're, uh, you're inevitably going to experience quite a bit of growing pains. It's a huge leap from, you know, college to the pros. And uh, he's handled it relatively well, I think. Um, obviously there was this whole you know, the Bears have a love-hate relationship with their fans and vice versa and there's generally mass disagreement about what the franchise should be doing both inside and outside the organization but um, it appears that keeping Dalton on the field for as long as they did might have just been a hindrance to the development of Justin Fields as a rookie because he's progressing well and he's doing it because he's getting the snaps that he needs finally um, you know, he, he's getting that real time experience that he needs to grow. And it's, uh, it's looks like it's paying dividends already. I mean, there are times during this game where he was able to hang in the, hang in the pocket and, you know, deal the ball downfield, like a legitimate NFL starter. And there are times when he bailed from a, a pocket with phantom pressure. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that he's doing a lot of what you see from high caliber players when they're rookies, which is, you know, Cherish, he's, giving you what his traits when the pocket him. and the play breaks down he's he's doing a great job impro improvising yeah he improvises well but give it but when he's given proper support from his teammates he's not to excel and he was mm -hmm. getting it for you know significant stretches of time on on sunday on uh, monday night against the steelers despite you know that 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 game wrecking defense that the steelers always field um they did aptly and uh it sort of gives you an idea of what this franchise could be capable of with competent coaching and decent roster well, building. And I think a big part of that is the O-line. I mean, you, you yeah. said, you, you know, we talked about the, the phantom pressure sometimes. I mean, when you got a, when you got a, an offensive line like that, I'd always think pressure is coming too. So, um, and he hasn't been getting much help from play calling and, and not much help from his, his supporting cast. So, I think we saw a vintage Allen, Allen Robinson game, what we expect from him. And uh, Justin Fields performed. Bryce, what do you think? You know, I liked how he was using his receivers and getting it, spreading the ball around. You know, you had Cole Komet, six receptions, 87 yards. You had, like you mentioned, Allen Robinson, four for 68. He even got Jimmy Graham involved. He came out of nowhere, got a catch for 28 yards. He really did. Yeah. I I like how he's spreading the ball around, you know, getting it accurate, getting it where it needs to be, driving the ball down the field. I think he's shown a lot of growth from, you know, his preseason debut. He, he took a lot of heat for his preseason, not throwing the ball, just uh, relying on his legs a lot more. So I like what I saw from him in the passing game. Did you guys see that one drive in the red zone where Fields went to Jimmy Graham all three times? Yeah. Maybe you don't recall that. That yeah, in the is back of end zone. one of the most blatant examples of bad coaching. All three of those plays were schemed to Jimmy Graham too. That that was his first read. Mm -hmm. Three to the same player in the red zone when you got a score. Mm -hmm. So um, considering the – Frankly, the, the the bad situation he's in, um, I think he did a great job. So, yeah, I mean, that was exciting to see. Um, way back in Thursday night, if you can remember that game, we saw Mike White go down and John Johnson. Or, Josh. yeah, John Johnson. Huh? Josh Johnson. Josh Johnson, uh, yeah. He the XFL stepped up legend. at quarterback. He was throwing the ball well. 317 um, and three touchdowns. Right. And he was 
like the highest scoring quarterback, high scoring player in our league as a free agent right now. So Mike White did it the, the, the week before and Zach Wilson's struggles continue uh, as AFC experts over here. What do you make of the quarterback situation in New York? Because Josh Johnson and Mike White had spectacular games passing. Zach Wilson is yet to eclipse their numbers in the box score. I think it's more coaching, honestly, because you're bringing in these street free agents, one from XFL, one who's just coming back into the league after time off. And they're both having these dominant 300-yard, three-touchdown games out of nowhere. I think most of most of the credit has to go to, um, is it Matt or Michael for whoever it is, but it's more coaching, like I said, than actual quarterback play, in my opinion. Because you have lackluster talent around him, so you're not going to get these receivers helping him out as much. Maybe the offense is as easy to run as Mike White and Josh Johnson made it look. Maybe this uh, offense is designed to be uh, easy to run as a QB. I mean, it could be, you know, simple reads and uh, generic routes, you know, guys across the line and tight ends, you know, helping the quarterback read the defense before each snap. Um, I think that it, the team looked, looked in the past two games like they've been set up to succeed as someone with little experience in the NFL. And Zach Wilson hasn't been able to do what these two guys did in emergency last minute, throw them out there because we need a court, we need someone to throw the ball type of starts. And they've both just blown the doors off. Um, I, I don't want to say that, you know, Zach Wilson's a bust because that's obviously far too soon. He needs more time. But it's not indicative of future success that he's not able to make this offense work when the two guys behind him on the depth chart can do it so much better right. with such, we, we, you know, without taking very many practice, practice reps with the ones and without uh, having this whole thing schemed for them. Well, it was nice to see, too, about, how... Something can be said about the lack of film that, that mm-hmm. these op- opponents have seen of the backups. But I, agree I just with don't think it's like a 200, 300 yard passing difference. No. I think that, I was just uh, saying it was. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was um, just I... saying it was nice. To... <laughs> go ahead, mate. Go, right, go ahead, Bryce. No, I was just going to say it's nice to see Elijah Moore finally step into mm-hmm. that role that we've all been waiting for from him. Had mm-hmm. 84 yards and two touchdowns. He finally is starting to be a reliable target for whoever they put out on at quarterback next week. I think he's just starting to get used correctly too. I think yeah. that's part of it. Um, yeah. Okay. We have a big report coming out mid podcast. Dalvin Cook's ex-girlfriend has alleged that she was the victim of assault on that night. As we saw reports come out earlier today, that Dalvin Cook was a victim of domestic abuse and of, um, like being blackmailed for a million dollars or something crazy like that. So not to dive specifically into this situation, but we have seen a lot about character issues across the NFL recently. Damon Arnett posting the video threatening Gruden. He gets cut. Henry Ruggs, obviously going 156 in Vegas and copying a DUI and vehicular manslaughter charge. So how important is looking at someone's character in the pre-draft process. Obviously it's important is the answer here, but just how important is it? Is it make or break for a draft pick? I think it is. I think it's um, one of the most important things you can do when drafting because, you know, you can try and fit a guy in your scheme. You know, you can look at the player's traits alone and say, oh yeah, I could use this. But if you don't, if you don't sit down face to face with the guy, you don't shake his hand and say, Hey, tell me, you know, about your story, you know, so you can get, get an idea of what this person's really like. It, you know, they, they could be the greatest athlete anyone's ever seen, but if they don't work well, if they, you know, if they don't mesh with your team's mentality, if they don't, you know, sympathize with your goals and they're not willing to sacrifice personal success for the betterment of the team. Um, and they, you know, they're not willing to keep their head down when they need to and, you know, shine when their time to shine comes, then what's the point of having them on that team? You're not trying to build you know, a list of talented players who are going to win you something. You're trying to build a team that functions well together and there's nothing more important than their 
you know, the fact that they can function well together. I mean, some of the best offensive lines in the league aren't studded with all pros and pro bowls. They're studded with guys who can, you know, um, pass, you know, pass, uh, pass rushes onto one another, you know, who can communicate efficiently, um, you know, wide receivers who can, you know, build this uh, solid chemistry with their quarterback you know, and who are willing to selfless. block downfield to spring people, you know, yes, guys who are selfless um, are infinite, you know, they're just as important as the guy who's going to make the, you know, the big 70 yard touchdown over a defender. I think that um, um, most of the pre-draft process should be trying to figure out who, who you think works on your team because you know, all the talent doesn't matter in the world if uh, you can't get them a on the field consistently because of off the field issues um, or b working well with the team and uh, until until the, you know until you know if a guy's going to make make it work with you then uh, I think that the entire idea of getting him on your roster just to have the talented player is moot. Just to add to Yeston's point. I can think of two names that slid down the draft board pretty much right before a draft with Shane Ray way back when and Reuben Foster. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. both of them great talents, but just pre-draft issues had them slid gone from the farther league down. Yeah, both of them are gone, and they both slid way farther than they were projected to be. So. Now, another case that comes to mind for me is Laramie Tunsil, right before the draft, that video of him blazing up out of a gas mask. Um, I mean, that's, that's, I, would, I would classify that as a character issue, or, or at least I think an NFL team would, and he's been a huge success. So, um, you know, it puts these GMs in predicaments. Do you spend a high pick on these guys with character issues? Do you do you wait to see if they're going to slide to you? Is it even worth spending a seventh round draft pick on someone who could be cut the next week for doing something stupid off the field? So, um, yeah, I, I think with Laramie Tunsil in particular, it was sort of a scandal because there's the there's sort of still in a lot of in a lot of America there's this significant stigma about marijuana and uh the use of a lot of you know um pretty mainstream relatively safe options for um you know feeling good there's tons of, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot there's a lot of options out there but there's still quite a bit of stigma around it and it's it, it's improving but NFL teams considered it a character issue but it didn't really say much about he, who he was as a person and who he was as a teammate you know, it was indicative of a potential off the field issue, but it wasn't so significant that it would, you know, prevent him from being a good teammate. You know, he wasn't gonna right. go out there and try and, you know, sleep with his teammate's wife or, you know, uh, uh, rob a convenience store. It was, you know, it's. It, I think that right. you know, it was strategic to release the footage when they did, and I understand why certain franchises and certain leads would. Uh, disagree with it but i don't think that it was it, it made it, it was as bad as it looked for him however there are so many examples where, where of, of, of news coming out about players where they do have those kind of issues that are going to negatively impact the team as a whole right and um i think that it's something that you do have to absolutely consider when uh when trying to select somebody for your team and the same goes for free agents and trades but i think uh it's kind of shocking that it did happen the way it did to Tunsil. Um, because you would imagine that the you know, NFL head coaches, general managers, and owners can look past a lot when it comes to athletic young players yeah. full of adrenaline. Um, it just seems shocking that of all the things that they decided not to look past, Larry Tunsil's gas mask incident was one of them. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are also things like... Um... For example, Henry Ruggs sounds like he was a good teammate. He's just an idiot off the field. You know, like he made a a stupid young person mistake. He's only 22. Um, But that's something to look at. And then I I just feel like teams are going to be more apprehensive this this draft around about about things that could potentially that that could potentially keep a player off of a roster. Um, If you guys remember correctly, if I remember correctly, Montez Sweat was supposed to be a top 10 pick. And then it came out the week before the draft that he had heart issues. He slid to like 16 or 18, where he was drafted by the Washington football team. Um, 
in this year's draft, if that happened, I would think that it, there has to be more in the back of the minds of GMs that's like, you know, what if this even keeps him from ever playing a play? Mm-hmm. Or uh, same thing with Jalen Phillips and his concussion issues. Maybe we spend a second rounder on him because he could never play a game for us. So um, I think it affects not just off the field uh, teammate issues. Um, I think it affects things like health and uh, just question marks about having production from a player that you spend a high pick on. Um, now, it, it's early in, this, in in his career, but we also saw a lot about Micah Parsons and him being a bad teammate and idiot off the field. And through eight games, he's been an incredible player, worthy of the pick that he was selected at. And he seems to be a good teammate, and he's staying out of trouble off the field. So you just never know with those things. I always think that's an an interesting conversation, especially now when we have a lot of news coming out. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a bigger issue this year than it's been in years past. And it's becoming more and more common as – it's harder and harder to stay invisible with this kind of stuff. I mean, through like the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even into the 2000s, a lot of people could do a lot of stuff and just get away with it because, you know, news didn't travel at a fraction of a second, you know, worldwide. Uh, half this information would never come out if it wasn't for the fact that we live in a particularly visible era. And um, I think so now more than ever, they do have to consider it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, if we look back at this past week, uh, there are a couple games that taught us a lot about certain teams. Uh, so I think we should all pick a game where you learned a lot about the two teams involved. I will go first. I'll give you guys some time to look. My, my game that taught me a lot about both teams was the Vikings and the Ravens going into overtime. We'll start with the Vikings here. I think they hung in there really well. Um, when you look at the box score, Kirk was having a below average day passing. He was 17 for 28 with 187 yards, but he had a QB rating of uh, 104.3 and he slung two touchdowns. He was averaging 6.7 yards per attempt, Um, but it really went through through the ground with Delvin Cook. Uh, He had 17 carries for 110 yards. He was averaging six and a half and uh, they got a lot of special teams production out of their rookie from Iowa State, Kenne and Wongwu. Um, and then on, on the defensive side of things, they were swarming the pass rusher. They had three sacks and eight quarterback hits. Um, their linebackers were, were playing exceptionally, exceptionally well, especially Eric Kendricks, who tallied 17 tackles. I think they looked like a complete team despite the loss. And then the Ravens, it raises some question marks for me. Lamar Jackson threw for two picks. They could not get any pressure on the quarterback. They had zero sacks for six quarterback hits. Uh, Marquise Brown had another good game. He was bailing out Lamar Jackson. We saw more of Rashad Bateman, five catches for 52 yards, averaging 10.4. So I think we see a lot of potential with this Ravens team, but I feel like we're waiting for the 50-point game where they dominate a really good team, and we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, they're still in in, in the Super Bowl mix. So. Um, yeah, I just think we learned a lot here about a, a squandering Minnesota team that's sitting at three and five right now. And maybe this Baltimore Ravens team uh, is not progressing at the rate we thought they would, despite the six and two record. Well, I'd say it's a game I learned a lot about. Here. Uh, I learned a lot about the teams involved here was um, probably the Texans Dolphins. Mm. I, uh, I, I thought. You know there was a that there would be that there was a significant drop off between Tua and Jacoby Brissett. You know I thought that you know not that Tua was incredible. I still think he needs time, uh, but I think that the drop from him to Brissett was supposed to be more significant than it really is, and it's not indicative of a quality starter when you have a journeyman backup who's performing to the standard of your believed franchise quarterback. Um, at least for now, we don't know what they're going to do in the offseason. Uh, and the Texans, um, I thought that Tyra Taylor would be enough to lift this offense um, a little bit higher. You know, not, not, not far, of course, you know, sort of from like 30, 30th, 31st, up to maybe 25th, 26th, but enough to make a difference in some NFL mm-hmm. games. And yet, you know, but, uh, it, they consistently fell short. Uh, the Dolphins' defense had been in a slump all year, and then they proved they came out and played like a team that you know, the, the secondary that we saw all of last season 
you know, one of the league's mm-hmm. best that, you know, gave some of the best teams in the NFL trouble. Um, and I think most importantly, I learned that neither of these teams are who they thought they were at the start of this season. Mm-hmm. The Texans thought they were, you know, a decent team who are, uh, you know, who were a quarterback away from competing. But the Dolphins thought that one more year of progression and, you know, what they had believed to be a decent off season was going to set them right and have them in the mix. And now they're acutely aware that overperforming last year didn't equate to long-term success. Um, yeah, I think that I, uh, both of these teams should ultimately be extremely disappointed with where they sit right now. And this game was just further proof of that fact. I got to go with the Browns and uh, Bengals game here. I think we might have jumped on the Bengals bandwagon for this year a little bit too early. I think a lot of us saw that Joe Burrow, like dominant four or five games and them just five and two out of nowhere and thought they were going to go like divisional round playoff game. When like they, they showed they still have like few holes on defense. I still think their corners could be a little bit better. I don't really, I'm not that confident in their pass rushers, but all in all, I think, this uh, Bengals rebuild is going pretty much how you'd hope it would be. Now on the Brown side, I think like that few, what is it? Three or four game stretch where they just didn't look like what we expected them to. I think they're finally out of that one right now and finally starting to show what they can become without Odell Beckham. Nick Chubb, 137 yards and two touchdowns. You could not stop him uh, last last week. Baker had 218 and two touchdowns. I think this offense is um, finally starting to peak like we all expected it to. And it only took them losing in a, a former all pro to do it. Mine's not really that surprising. Everybody thought that Cliff couldn't do it without DeAndre and Kyler Murray. And everybody thought the 49ers were going to be so And AJ Green good. and Chase Edmonds. But I knew this was coming. Bad, and Cardinals are really good. Um, I do have to make an apology. We've been doing two of Tuesdays since, like, I don't know, maybe week two, week three. And it's happened now. I think this is, like, the fourth time we talk about something serious or something that, like, I shouldn't, like, look like I'm laughing at. But this time was good, right? So about a half hour ago on the Sports Wave official Instagram, we posted this video about – You saw it. Who, Jordan Clarkson and the caption was something along the lines of like still don't know about the long socks but I do know Jordan Clarkson is in his bag like (laughs) some of the comments on this like I don't I still don't know how air conditioning makes air cold I still don't know what a prime number is that was comments by Jack Stalo who just like keeps dodging I don't know why she doesn't love me back (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't understand, like, how that is where we got from there. <laughs> and, like, I commented from the TSW.NHL account, and usually I'm the one that's, quote, out of pocket in the comment section, but I was, like, the normal one there, which that's, that Jeremy M474 is saying, I'm in your walls. I don't know if that's, like... <laughs> a double on Tadra or like he's literally in somebody's walls that we know. Um, yeah. 49ers aren't that good. <laughs> no, uh, I knew. So I how do we get from social media comments to Niners being terrible? Because I mean, Cliff I, Kingsbury is coach of the year to him. <laughs> he should be to everybody though. Like, no, the GM should be executive of the year, and I think that that's, that's where it ends. Steve Kime? No, no way. I'm exaggerating. I just think that they've uh, – essentially, they threw a bag of money. In Kyler's the developing. <laughs> <laughs> Kyler's developing nicely, though. Yes. Yes, he is. And they uh, were smart enough to get the pieces around him, too, with great run game. They got a bunch of receivers. DeAndre Hopkins, they need to use Rondo more, a lot more than they are. AJ Green, yeah, AJ Green, they got an offseason. I expected him to probably only play two, three games before injury, but still. (laughs) 
Yeah, he's. It's kind of nice to see him him play well, but it's. I'm never going to get used to seeing him anywhere except Cincinnati. Right. I don't think. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He he could win uh, Offensive Player of the Year. He could win a Super Bowl MVP. It doesn't matter. That man's always going to be a Bengal to me. Let's take a page out of George Zane's book before we wrap it up. Uh, Yeston, three words, game of the week. Oh, oh wait, like actually, three. can I say something first? I really yeah. doubt George <laughs> is going to like listen to this. But the fact that he had Mike White as the fifth best quarterback after week eight is ridiculous. <laughs> like, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't like adjust them based on the season. It's like that week. Like there was not four quarterbacks better. He had the most passing yards. His jersey was at the Hall of Fame. Anyway, I, I agree. He probably should have been top two at worst. That was ridiculous. All right, <laughs> go on. Yeah, right. no. So three, three words. words injustice. Yeah, three words for my game of the week. Yeah. For this coming week. Week ten, which I Jesus. can't believe we're at week ten already. Uh, yeah, it go. They grow up so it's fast, depressing. guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh Jesus Christ! This is this isn't a. Uh, there's a lot of mediocre to bad games next week. There really is. There's maybe one or two good games at at most. <laughs> All right, game of the week, and I'm going to say not because it's good, or just because I think it'll be fun. Um, it's going to be Bucks at football team. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the uh, NFC Wild Card death. rematch. Rematch of last yeah. year. Yeah, rematch of last year's wild card. You know, I, I think we could see uh, we could see uh, some big stuff from from Heineke. I say big, I mean medium stuff. That's as big as he goes. Um, I'm gonna say <laughs> Bucks crush him. Three words. It's not it's not gonna be pretty, but I am gonna enjoy watching whatever the hell happens in that game because I they're gonna you know, Rivera's going into his bag. I guarantee it. Tova, I'll let you go. Um, I'm going to go Herbert for MVP this week. The Chargers play the Vikings. Um, I think Justin Herbert is in the MVP race. I don't think he's near the top right now, but I think he goes close to the top right now. Um, and with a dominant showing over, a Vikings defense that has really been progressing these last few weeks. I'm going to speak for Bryce and me. Uh, Jets, Bills, I love Bryce. Spotify, Apple, please watch this video on YouTube. Need this job. We're out.